Good morning, everybody. We're going to get underway with our next session shortly. So my name is David Garcia. I am the policy director at the Turner Center. Uh, if you're looking at your agenda, we have made a slight change. Uh, I am not Tia Boatman Patterson. Uh, she unfortunately couldn't join us, so uh, I, I will be introducing the next panel. So um, before uh, we jump into the next panel, I'd like to um, just uh, say how much uh, I, I enjoyed the last panel. It's really exciting to hear about the innovations that are coming in housing construction, not just in the future, but are actually happening today. Um, and as we think about innovating the construction sector, you know, we also have an additional challenge as far as uh, the innovation of policy itself. You know, this is a challenge that we face every day, not just in innovative housing types, but in housing generally. Where we're allowed to build housing, how many units we're allowed to build, uh, how tall is that building allowed to be. So uh, that's going to be the topic of our next panel, really is how do we, uh, in addition to innovating construction, how do we also innovate uh, you know, where we're allowed to build housing? How do we disrupt density? Uh, and uh, that, that's the subject of our next uh, panel, and our, our, uh, our guests will be joining us here shortly, and I have the uh, honor of introducing them. So um, first, we have Dan Perlick, who is the founding principal of Opticos Design and a driving force behind the movement for missing middle housing. And uh, you heard Carol uh, use this term earlier. Missing middle housing is actually something that Dan coined uh, in 2010. So it's been around for, for a while. Uh, in addition, we have uh, Adi Nagraj, who is a San Francisco director of SPUR, which is a Bay Area planning and urban research association where he sees uh, all policy formation and advocacy and have had the opportunity to work with Adi on, on a number of, of issues. Um, we also have Amanda Daflos, who is the Innovation Director at the Los Angeles Mayor's Office, where she has worked on new ways to promote housing creation uh, in, in Los Angeles. Um, and also, the panel today will be moderated by Liam Dillon, who, as many of you uh, will know, uh, is a Los Angeles Times uh, reporter who covers uh, housing policy and politics, uh, not just in Sacramento, but statewide. Uh, I would also be remiss if I didn't uh, mention that uh, Liam is also the co-host of uh, what is, in my opinion, the best housing podcast out there. Uh, it's called Gimme Shelter. If you haven't had a chance to listen to it, I, I would recommend you do so. Um, but uh, last but certainly not least, we also are honored to have California State Senator Scott Weiner with us this morning, who represents San Francisco's District 11. Um, in my opinion, Senator Weiner is uh, at the forefront of thinking about this idea of innovation around uh, policy and density, and he has been a leader uh, during his time in San Francisco, as well as uh, at the state capitol, in uh, thinking about the policy solutions that will actually help us build more homes and build them in the right places. So um, we have asked uh, Senator Weiner to open this panel uh, with uh, uh, his perspective on state policy on the issue of density. So um, without, without further ado, please help me uh, in uh, welcoming uh, State Senator Scott Weiner. Thank you. Um, so thanks for having me today, and for and I want to thank the Turner Center for uh, for doing this because we uh, we have to do things differently on housing. Uh, you know, when people sometimes uh, come at me and criticize me and blow me up on Twitter or what, whatever else about uh, saying uh, we need to try uh, new aggressive uh, things, I'd like to always start out with the question: Well, the way we've been doing everything for 50 years, how's that going? How, how's that working out uh, for you know, all the middle class people who are being driven, uh, driven out uh, to the Central Valley or to uh, Denver or Austin or wherever else, or Reno now? Uh, how's that going for the families that are living in their cars because uh, there's nowhere for them? Uh, how, how's that going? So, uh, and, and it's not going the way it needs to go, but I do think that we are starting to see uh, change. It's, and it's slow and it's painful, but it is intensely uh, overdue. Uh, and if you look at uh, how we've approached housing, uh, we, housing is pretty foundational to everything else. 
can't get a, it's hard to get a good education if you don't have housing or stable housing. It's hard to be healthy. Um, it's hard to accomplish other things in life if you have to worry about where you're going to be sleeping that night or whether you're going to lose your apartment uh, next month uh, or whether you're couch surfing with friends. Uh, yet, unlike other critically important policy areas like education, like healthcare, we have taken this approach in California that the state should have little or no role. That housing is just this local matter and local communities know what's best. And so if cities and towns want more housing, great. If they don't want more housing, great. If they want to zone all of their land for single family homes around, around jobs and around transit so that they can basically ban poor people from living in their cities, go for it. We've had that attitude that the locals know best, and so the state should just butt out. Uh, and imagine if I said to you, I have a, a new bill for next year for our public schools that we're going to let every school district decide how many days a year they're going to educate kids, whether or not they use credential teachers, whether or not they teach science and math, because the local communities know best. You would laugh me out of the room. And yet that's what we've done for housing, and it's helped to drive us into a ditch. And we need to get out of that ditch. And it's not about eliminating local control. It's about rebalancing and having enforceable state standards so that we actually create enough housing, so that we actually embrace the notion that it should be a priority to have enough housing for everyone. Uh, so we are working to make it uh, faster to approve housing. Uh, to say if you zone for X amount of housing, you need to approve it. You can't put people through a five-year process. You can't use design review as a way to create a five-year process. You can't chop it down from 20 units to five units. You got to approve it. Uh, we have uh, now, we're, we're working on zoning reform. And I tried it this year, didn't work. We're going to try it again next year. Uh, because it is not sustainable, for example, that the city and county of San Francisco, that 70% of our land mass is zoned either for single family or two units. That is absolutely unacceptable. LA, same thing. Vast swaths of land in this major job center, transit center, where we ban apartment buildings. Only single family homes uh, are allowed. We went through all of these down zonings. Uh, and that is no longer sustainable if it ever was. And so we're going to reform zoning uh, and uh, require that cities actually allow apartment buildings near jobs uh, and near transit. So we have to do these reforms and the state has to have a role. And it's not about beating up on city councils and mayors and saying, you're all terrible people. That's, I'm a former local elected official. Uh, we, but I also have experienced firsthand what it feels like when your constituents come at you and say, do you vote for that project? I'm pulling recall papers tomorrow. You know, we're asking our local elected officials to put their heads on the chopping block every week to say, well, you better meet your housing goals and you better go out there every week and vote for more projects and just anger your constituents. And that's what we're, we're trying to create, frankly, cover so that local elected officials can say, these are the rules. We have to approve this. Uh, and we've seen that happening already. Uh, and the number of city council members who have come to me and said, you know what, publicly I had to oppose what you're doing, but thank you for doing it because it makes our lives a lot more uh, doable in terms of governing cities. Um, we also are seeing, I think, finally, um, a, a reckoning that we need to reduce the cost of delivering new housing. Uh, there are currently conversations happening between the building industry and the construction trade unions um, about establishing a residential wage, understanding that there's a difference between high-rise steel construction uh, and low-rise and mid-rise uh, wood frame construction, understanding that Fresno and San Francisco aren't the same in terms of costs and in terms of what people expect 
uh, to earn. And so I'm thrilled that labor and the building industry are actually having conversations about how do we come up with a residential wage that will make these projects pencil out and that will expand access to unionized labor. We want our construction workers to be in the middle class and not to have to commute three hours to work, which a lot of them are doing uh, now. And so I am really praying that those conversations uh, bear fruit. Um, and then we are um, recommitting to uh, funding affordable housing for low-income people. The state has been derelict for many years. Uh, the federal government is just uh, a train wreck on these issues, and we are stepping up in California to gradually um, help with those investments. And then, of course, the, uh, we have to grapple uh, with the epidemic of displacement and evictions uh, in California, uh, and the legislature has shown lack of capacity uh, to make uh, bold strides in protecting tenants. Uh, the, what happened at the ballot on Tuesday, frankly, was not helpful in the political dynamic, that it was such a landslide and the defeat of Prop 10. But I know that there is a broad desire in the legislature uh, to try to come up with some stronger protections for tenants because, of course, our goal needs to be to add a lot more housing, not to just replace the people who are already there. Uh, so those are my thoughts, and I look forward to the panel today. Good morning, everyone. I'm Liam Dillon with the LA Times. Looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I'll, since the introductions uh, were a bit ago, I'll introduce everybody uh, again. So to my left is Adi, to his left, Dan, Amanda, and Senator Weiner. And just a quick reminder uh, that um, you can ask questions on our live stream. And so I'm um, looking forward to getting some uh, questions from folks outside of here as well. So um, my first question will be for the Senator. Um, so. Two years ago, or beginning of 2017 and 2017, sort of the first time in a long while that the state legislature has really involved itself um, in a sort of a, a, a large package of legislation when it comes to housing. Uh, one of your bills, seven, uh, SB 35, was a major part of that, and I'm hoping we can start um, by you talking about what, that bill and what it what it does. Uh, sure. Um, so we did have a package of about 15 bills in 2017. Uh, this is a, a, a broad effort, and we have great leaders here in the Bay Area, people like Senator Nancy Skinner and uh, Assemblyman David Chu and Phil Ting and others, and, and so it's been a great team effort. But uh, the, my c contribution to that package was uh, Senate Bill 35, uh, which is a very um, simple idea that we've had housing goals for 40, 50 years, uh, the Regional Housing Needs Assessment Arena, Every eight years, every city gets uh, a n numbers. Here's how many market rate, uh, moderate income, low income, very low income, you should produce in the next eight years. Uh, with n no teeth, no consequences if you don't do it. So what we learned is that two thirds of California cities uh, do not meet any of their income level uh, arena goals. They don't meet any, even market rate, nothing, two thirds. 97% don't meet their low income uh, goals. Part of that is because they've maybe banned low-income housing by zoning only for single-family homes, uh, or they just don't have the money, or they don't have the political will. Uh, and so SB 35 um, provides that if you are not meeting your, uh, re your housing goals by income category, for whatever categories you're falling short, you become streamlined. And then if you catch up, you're no longer streamlined. And streamlining means no CEQA, uh, no discretionary review, no conditional use, no appeals, nothing. It's a ministerial permit subject to design review for three to six months under objective design standards. Uh, and then for smaller buildings, there are no prevailing wage requirements. For larger buildings, uh, there are. Uh, it defers to local inclusionary. If there is lo no local inclusionary, then it's 10% inclusionary. Um, uh, and if you are meeting your market rate housing goals, then the inclusionary is 50%. So for that one third of cities that do meet their uh, market rate goals. Uh, we've already seen projects starting to move forward. Uh, the most, um, I think, uh, publicized is uh, uh, the Valco uh, project in Cupertino, a, a dead 
shopping center. It's not totally dead. It has one Chinese <laughs> restaurant, <laughs> a, dim sum, a dim sum restaurant that's still there. It's very good, actually. Um, but everything else is vacant. So you have this vacant, like, ghost mall. And for years, they wanted to develop it into 2,400 units of housing. And that's what it was zoned for in the housing element. Uh, but the, the politics were just so toxic around this development that it never happened. And so uh, the developer invoked SB 35, said we're going to do 50% affordable. Uh, and th they can do that because there's an office component that can subsidize that. Uh, and they have their permit. Uh, so we're also seeing in San Francisco several 100% affordable projects that have invoked SB 35. Uh, there are some smaller ones around the state, and we're, we're, there are some that are considering it in LA. So uh, Dan, thank you for mentioning the Cupertino project. That brings me to Dan. You're, you're working on that project. Can you talk me through some of the, the thought process for um, why the decision was made to use it and how it's actually played out in the process? Yeah, so the, the city of Cupertino at the beginning of, of 2018 brought our firm on board and our team to uh, navigate a specific plan um, through approval and zoning amendments through approval. And shortly thereafter, um, the major property owner, Sand Hill, submitted the SB 35 proposal. So um, uh, the reason that the city brought us on board, um, as Senator Weiner said, is it was an extremely toxic environment, which had seen um, uh, the earlier proposal for this site voted down in a, in a ballot measure. Actually, there was a ballot measure for, to, for to support the project and one to not support the project, and they, neither one of them was approved, so it was kind of in a state of, of, of catharsis. So the city brought us on board to um, help navigate, educate, and engage the community in a way where we could actually build support from a con majority consensus within the community that this indeed was a major opportunity for the city of Cupertino to meet its affordable housing goals as was defined in their, in their general plan. And so in an extremely truncated process, over the course of nine months, um, we went from start to finish in this robust public engagement process that focused on um, two four and a half day public design charrettes where we actually set up design studios um, in the city hall of Cupertino and, and invited the community members into this to help visualize um, different alternatives and, and opportunities for the site in terms of scale. Uh, we had to have that conversation about mid-rise and high-rise buildings. Um, it wasn't, the great thing about having SB 35 on the table, it, it wasn't a matter of a conversation about should we have big buildings, it was more of a matter of how, where is the best place for large, medium, and smaller buildings? Um, how do those buildings get put together in a way that creates the downtown, a vibrant mixed-use downtown that the community had envisioned in their general plan? And over the course of the nine months, we're able to um, sort of, you know, with the leverage that was provided by SB 35 in a very close uh, relationship of working back and forth with the major property owner to, to uh, the specific plan and the new zoning was adopted um, in September of this year. But that that was now just the uh, residents pulled a referendum on that, and that's so. Give me the current status, because my understanding is that the given that the the process now seems to be at a point that uh, there could, there would be an election on that um, specific plan, that the developers instead going to decide to go for the SB 35 program, where there is none of that uh, none of that delay or none of that decision making. Yeah, the SB 35 submittal is still on the table. And Scott, we can tell that, about that. The, yeah. the, the, this project is a prime example of what, why you have to have these state interventions, but also about people understanding what the right thing to do is and doing it when they have those incentives. So Cupertino City Council, some really terrific council members who, who get it and want to do the right thing, but the politics were so problematic that they couldn't. And so uh, with the SP35 option on the table there, knowing that this was going to happen one way or the other, the city council, they put together, I think, you know, it's a different plan, but it's a really solid plan. They passed it, uh, and as you mentioned, they did it in nine months. I, I'm used to, in San Francisco and many other places, when you talk about big rezonings, it can take five or 10 years, but it can happen on a good timetable if you have an incentive to do that. Uh, and so I think it was a very healthy process. 
So uh, just help everybody understand what the current status is now. Do you know the developer is moving forward with SP, this SP35 version of the project? Is that, that currently what's going on? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, Amanda, I wanna move to, to you. Um, uh, LA is, I just saw a, a number um, that the city's on pace for something like 5,000 new ADUs um, this year, which is a huge increase over, uh, over historically what LA has produced in that, in that area. And I, I'm wondering, uh, can you talk me through, because there's been a lot of changes in some of the rules for allowing uh, ADUs, or I like to call them casitas, um, uh, in the city over the last few years. How has that process worked, and what were the major sort of fault lines there? Um, sure. So we, um, in, in my office, the, really the mayor's office, started researching uh, ways to actually <laughs> increase supply of housing in Los Angeles. So we started doing that in 2015. Uh, for a lot of the same reasons that we've, we've already talked about here, which is that we sort of saw this coming wave. We were experiencing <clears throat> a wave of, of just really needing more housing. Um, and of course, our homelessness issue, for those that have been in LA, um, that, that issue has become increasingly more acute. Um, and so we really started looking at ADUs as, a, as one part of a solution for adding supply. And what we quickly realized in talking with families was that ADUs are very hard to build in LA. Um, and part of that was legislative, part of that was process, and part of that was not understanding, um, and part of that was financing. Um, and so my office spent a good amount of time um, interviewing what at the time was about 600 people who had built ADUs over the course of 10 years. Um, and so that number pales dramatically in comparison to the number that you just cited, um, because we were able to really get a handle on the data and better understand that that, that really was the number. Um, over the course of about 10 years, 600 people had uh, taken ADUs all the way through and gotten a certificate of occupancy. So in learning that those were the reasons that were preventing people, um, we've, we've started what has now been a three year, three and a half year process. Um, and we did a pilot project, and we did a pilot project to really test what was difficult um, and so we built, we're, we're in the process, it's due to finish in December, um, but we've spent the last year building a home um, with a willing family um, that wanted an ADU, and um, we built that home, we've, we've sort of followed the course of that home to learn uh, from a process point of view what the city could do better and what the city could do differently. Um, and we have a very long list of things, as most cities would, um, in terms of what we, what we can do differently. Um, legislatively, um, of course, in 2017, um, part of your package that passed um, made a, a big difference and a big change in Los Angeles and many cities across the, the state, which was that what we, what we had had on the books as LA, um, we, were, we were sort of using that for ADUs and, and it was part of the reason why only 600 had been passed at the time. Um, it was confusing. There were three pieces of legislation that were somewhat conflicting or just confusing. Um, and the state law came into effect, and now suddenly, as of January 2017, um, we were able to defer to state law. And what state law did for LA was it, it just clarified some of the things that across, the, across those varying pieces of legislation. Um, it clarified some things, made it easier for the city to express what ADU policy is and was. Um, and since January 2017, um, we've seen a tremendous uptick. Um, the number is not quite as high as you mentioned, um, but we're right around 3,000, three, between three and 4,000 uh, permits that have been uh, requested since January 2017. And you can do the math, that's a lot more than 600 um, over 10 years. Um, and so what it's, what it's really done, I think, is open up opportunity. And then in the project that we've, we've been doing as a city, um, we've, we've spent a lot of time trying to take care in making the process easier, um, clarifying it. We published a handbook to make it, um, again, just clearer for residents on how to do it. Um, and importantly, we started testing um, different ways to finance ADUs. And in that pilot project I mentioned where we're building a home, um, we partnered with a local CDFI to, to really think about how to finance these because what we had heard from folks was that they would do them. If they could figure it out, they would do them. Um, but that it was, it was simply hard to, to finance it. Um, so that was the, the first wave of work we've done, and now we're about to get into, um, you know, another really interesting project, which will be uh, figuring out how to incentivize people in LA to now build these, uh, but build them and actually use them to help support people who are homeless, uh, because we see that that is a tremendous opportunity. So um, there's a lot in that, of course, but that's that's now what the city is is moving towards um, with a grant that we've just received. I want to follow up on, on, on one thing. It's my understanding that, that you know, there was a, a city's efforts to sort of reform its policy for a very long time. There was a lawsuit, that, a court ruling that put that pro city's own process on hold. A lot of discussion about how are we going to reform the city's own ordinances for this, and, and that's when the state law came in, and basically you're able to defer to that. Uh, I'm wondering, though, 
given uh, the amount of, of increase in production, whether you've seen um, uh, opposition from neighborhoods or opposition from individuals about the fact that there is this, this, this large increase coming in. Yeah. And I think over time, ADUs in most communities, and, and, and I would say that we're part of sort of a, an international network on this conversation. In most communities, there's been pushback at points, um, but I think particularly because the, the housing crisis is acute, not just in Los Angeles, not just in San Francisco, but um, really in places all over the country, Denver, uh, we've, we, as a city, we receive a lot of calls from Denver, um, a number of cities in Oregon, um, a number of cities in Washington, um, France reached out yesterday. So th there's you know, a lot of momentum around the question of how do you actually um, help homeowners build these. And so I think over time, particularly with the state law pointing the direction towards where the state is going, um, I think you know, we've, we've seen less opposition and more understanding. Um, the city's also done, I think, uh, we've worked really hard to try to make it clearer as to what these are, right? They're not going to pop up in everyone's backyard. Not every backyard is eligible. Um, and in fact, in LA, 60% of them are conversions. Um, so there are structures that were already there, and people are taking them from being um, a pool house to being a place where mom and, and dad can live or um, a place where you can rent. Um, so there is opposition. The Airbnb question has been an important one. Um, that cities are dealing with, but um, but over time, I think the greater understanding of them and the the just more options are making it um, easier for people to understand. So. Adi, I want to I want to turn to you. Before you started working at Spur, you were a, a developer, uh, affordable housing developer, and I guess I'm wondering the, the long time that you've been in this business and even in your in your role now, how have you seen? Um, how arguments have changed in terms of what, what is working and what is not working for getting low-income housing approved yeah. in different regions. Yeah, it's, um, um, it has evolved and, and things are getting better. Before I start, I do want to thank the Turner Center and Carol um, for having all of us here. The Turner Center is, um, as I travel more around the country, um, it's really emerging as the kind of West Coast leader on housing policy. So. Um, they're doing great work and pumping out a lot of good information for us. And I also want to thank Scott for all of his great work. He, um, I think Scott's a major reason why the tone is changing and why politicians and planning commissioners have a little bit more cover um, to be pro-housing. Um, his work, the YIMBY movement, have been really helpful to change the tenor of the conversation. Um, how many people in the audience, just a show of hands, have been like a project manager to entitle a project. And so you are the one that you're getting yelled at in the community by council members, by commissioners, um, and you might get it entitled, you might not. If you do get it entitled, you then need to get a building permit, so then you're calling DPW and you're calling all the different departments, fire department, um, very a few people. Um, it is really hard. You've got to have really thick skin because you get yelled at a lot and it's exhausting and your partner hates you because you're miserable. It's a really, it's, it's a tough thing to do. And when I look back on projects that I entitled when I was younger, most of my experience has been at Mid-Pen Housing, which does a lot of kind of rural, more suburban work down in the peninsula, and Bridge, which is much more urban. Um, and also a lot of my professional experience has been on planning commission in Oakland, chairing the commission for two years. Um, it is hard. Um, and there are, there, it, it can be death by a thousand cuts. There are many different ways that projects can go awry. There might be a new community group that comes out, says, hey, this developer never consulted with me. Um, hey, that shadow is really gonna make an impact on the livability that I have in my unit. Um, there, just think about my own war stories. There was a, East Bay City that I worked in that um, we had financing, about $20 million of state financing, um, and the financing was gonna get pulled unless we got a building permit by a certain date. And the city and the city manager in this East Bay City um, didn't like something about our plans, didn't like that a tenant was in pre-identified and threatened revoking our building permit if we didn't identify the specific tenant that he wanted in the building. Um, that was one. Two is a South Bay city that um, had these water fees called water connections, where they said, hey, if you're building X number of units, you've got to pay to the city's water board, you know, I forget what the number is, over a million dollars of fees to pay for water connections. 
and how do I find water connections? Go to Craigslist, and um, this is probably like 10 years ago. Go to Craigslist and try to cobble together the 15 or 20 water connection rights that you have to build your building so that you don't create a drain on the city's water system. Um, these are the kind of things that, this is the, this is the muck of building development, which is why this stuff takes so, so long. Um, I feel like when I first started, um, well, I first differentiate, there's a kind of more urban environments, and if you're an affordable housing developer in more urban environments, and I'll put Oakland and San Francisco in the category, you're often kind of, you're often the good guy for a lot of people. You're helping to relieve the housing crisis. You're 100% affordable. You don't get the, um, you're not the target of a lot of anger by a lot of people. Um, there's still the generic bucket of you're gonna change traffic, your, your kids are gonna go to school with my kids, and who are these kids? Um, there's some of that, but your, um, your uphill path is a little less daunting than if you're in Palo Alto or Half Moon Bay or Sunnyvale, where there's also, on the affordable side, the um, income dynamic, where you're building in very, very wealthy cities, where the rhetoric around poor people and people of color is, um, is not subtle. Um, a lot of the market rate developers, as you know, they have a tough time in both types of jurisdictions. They're beaten up in the Oaklands and San Francisco's of, hey, our, our um, minimum community benefit packages, our, our community benefit packages that have been negotiated, they're minimums. That's the least you have to do. So what else are you gonna do? Um, is often the dialogue that I heard at Planning Commission in Oakland. Um, and developers would then get really frustrated. Hey, I'm playing by the rules. There's the table on the planning website that says I need to do X for affordable and Y for other community benefits. And now I'm being asked to increase that by 10 or 15%. Um, and that has provided a lot of frustration. I feel like over the last six years, over the six years that I was on Planning Commission, what is very different are the number of people, the number of young people that come out to Planning Commission meetings saying that they are sleeping three to a one bedroom, they're sleeping on couches. Um, the most dramatic example is one that I was recused um, from when I was at Bridge, but when um, Boston Properties was looking to build a tower at MacArthur Bart Station, um, I think it's 20 stories, is that right, Darren? The MacArthur, uh, the Boston properties, um, you know, in a two to four story neighborhood. The number of people that came out saying, um, we just need a lot more housing, it was, was critical to getting that passed. I think it was the month before Councilmember Cobb was running for re-election, mm -hmm. um, and it was pretty courageous for him also to back it. Um, but that, you know, getting 30 people out to a commission meeting would not have happened five years ago, and that gives planning commission cover to approve it. Um, which then is helpful for the city council to approve it. So literally just getting bodies out um, is really helpful. And lastly, I would say that, you know, Scott's work in Sacramento is so helpful because when you're a developer, you need the city. You, need the city. you don't want to upset Palo Alto or Sunnyvale because you need their planner to call you back. You need that building permit. You need the water connection approvals. Um, so there's only so much you're able, willing to politely push city officials or city bureaucrats to get what you want. So to have a higher entity or an outside entity help you as you're in the trenches, day-to-day -day negotiating your deal um, is helpful and it's, it's critical. So uh, in the election Tuesday, we elected in California a new governor. Um, that governor has uh, an extraordinarily ambitious um, housing agenda, including a proposal to build, um, for the state to build, 500,000 new units uh, every year for the next seven years um, through 2025, which is an order, order of magnitude in production that perhaps has never been seen in the state, uh, the highest number uh, to my recollection. Um, it's been done since the 60s when the, when the stats were, were starting to be kept was 320,000, so a lot more and a, a lot more for a very long time. Um, and, and I guess my, my question, this is opening up to anyone who, who would like to answer, what politically needs to happen, uh, local level, regional level, state level, uh, even federal level, for a goal like that to be, uh, to have a chance of being achieved? A, a lot has to happen. <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, I was, uh, when, when uh, Governor-elect Newsom, and also at the time, I, I think Antonio Villaraigosa, they were all saying, yeah, three and a half million homes. Uh, I was thrilled that that had been sort of injected 
uh, into the um, uh, governor's race. Um, of course, when they were uh, at the same time saying, we're gonna build three and a half million homes, and then when they were asked about the zoning reform bill, I did this, and not that that's a silver bullet, but that is a significant addition of new housing capacity. Uh, people, you know, there were different, you know, I think Viragosa was just against it. Uh, Gavin was, I think, open, but not willing to embrace it. And, uh, and so people are still very nervous about the politics of the reforms that are needed if we're going to do what I would love to do, which is three and a half million homes. And that is, to put it in context, I think at, a, at the height of our housing boom in California, I think in like the early 60s, we were building about maybe 300,000 a year. 320, yeah. Uh, no, keep in mind, we're a much larger state now, building 80,000, so we've really collapsed. But 500,000 is gonna be, uh, gonna require enormous political will and just doing things totally differently on housing. So we're, uh, zoning reform has to be a part of that. When you have huge swaths of, of the state, not just LA and San Francisco, even though both cities are offenders in terms of the down zonings that have happened, Throughout the state, we have vast swaths of land that are zoned only for single family. That has to change. It has to change. Uh, and that is incredibly uh, hard. Uh, we have to have uh, more of this, you know, nine months instead of five years in terms of the approval process. So I think there's more work to do on streamlining. We have to stop this game of cat and mouse with in-law units. LA and San Francisco, I think, have now, after decades, finally both embraced uh, in-law units, we're still seeing resistance. And so every year, you know, Nancy Skinner and Bob Wachowski and Phil Ting, they have to introduce new bills to try to close loopholes that cities are exploiting. Uh, so there, there's, there's so much aggressive work that has to happen. I know that uh, Governor-elect Newsom is committed to it. Uh, the president of the Senate, Tony Atkins, is a fierce housing champion. Speaker Anthony Rendon is a fierce, we have really strong pro-housing leadership in the legislature and the governor's uh, office. And so I, I think I see opportunities uh, for us to break down some of the political barriers and move forward. And, and I'm gonna build upon this notion of the, the dire need for zoning reform because a lot of our work is we're, we're often hired by cities to remove the barriers. It's just happening into incremental right. of, a, of a pace. and. I, I actually think the entire planning and zoning system needs a rethink because we have a system that's based on density, this dwelling units per acre that treats a 3,500 square foot unit the exact same as it treats a 350 square foot unit. So when we, when we talk about density, it doesn't actually mean, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people and that's part of the reason we started promoting this concept of missing middle housing. Um, and what that is, is it's, it's the scale of housing at like the two and three, maybe four stories, it may be on a 50 foot lot, the scale of a house that just happens to have two, four, six, or eight units in it. And as an example, we recently were on a walking tour of Midtown Sacramento and found a two story, beautiful turn of the century, 1920s courtyard apartment building on a 100 foot by 100 foot lot that had 18 units in it, and it generated a density of over, over 80 dwelling units per acre. <laughs> and I can guarantee- That's down the block for me, where I, I can, live. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, and then you don't even know, it fits totally, there's no, it yeah. doesn't look like a giant tower, or I mean, just, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. But, so, then, but then we ban that, yeah. it's all banned now. <laughs> right. Right. So, right. So, yeah. so part of our push is getting away from the conversation about density and sort of using the George Lakoff playbook and, and sort of how we frame this conversation about for the need, the, the need for a broader range of housing choices. And let's talk about housing types that exist in many of these neighborhoods that have become illegal and are non-conforming and remove those barriers. Sure, I, really quick, I, you know, I wanna get back to zoning, but if anyone else has something that's not zoning before we get there. Yeah, I had a man saying, saying, on the affordable side, and I've spoke to a few people here about this, my one person crusade, um, California's financing for affordable housing is uniquely fractured compared to other states in the country. Our, Rick talked about tax credits earlier. Our tax credits are administered by the Treasury Department, which has a direct line to the governor. Debt, grants, um, veterans money, all there are a bunch of, bunch of different sources of funds that sit with HCD or CalHFA or different departments in Sacramento. 
very few of which, actually none of which, have a direct line to the governor. There is no kind of housing director for the state that oversees all of the housing money and policy. And that is different than how other states operate. And so I think there is an opportunity to see structurally how Sacramento is organized. Could we consolidate? Could we be more like Oregon um, or Minnesota, states that are uniquely streamlined so that you have one director of housing, answers to the governor, administers all the money. So if there's a policy imperative of building more farm worker housing or vet housing or homeless housing, they then have all the tools financially to effectuate that and then a direct line to the governor to make sure the bully pulpit is, is pushing for it as well. So a financial reorg in California, I think is right for change. I think the thing I was gonna add at the, sort of at the local level, like truly the standing at the counter level, um, greater investment in systems in cities, right? So actually the system that you put a permit into or the thing that you do online or don't do online because cities don't have the money to actually make those things possible. Um, as we sort of look at this, this boom or we try to point in a direction of that, um, it, it continues to be, I think, our hope, at least in LA, as we observe those challenges that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis for, for workers and therefore for people who are trying to come in and take permits, whether you're an individual or you're a large company. Um, those things become really difficult and slow the process down. So it makes it, in some cases, so much more difficult um, to do things you need to do because cities just don't have the infrastructure, um, not every city, but a place like LA. Um, those infrastructure conversations don't often happen, um, but they are one of the main things that slow kind of all of us down. So uh, I think it's an important point that we, we often forget. Uh, Senator, you referenced your bill last year, SBA 27, uh, a number of times. It would have uh, basically, in a manner of speaking, allowed for uh, apartment complexes in areas surrounding transit. Uh, as you mentioned, that bill did not advance. And so I want to I want to ask, and you've mentioned a number of times that you plan to bring it back. But can't answer, so I'm going to ask the question this way: What what lessons did you learn from your experience last year, and how have the lessons informed what you plan to bring forward in the coming year? Uh, sure. Whenever you're doing hard legislation, uh, there are two ways to do it. You can uh, uh, build, build out the entire grand coalition before you introduce uh, anything, uh, which works for some bills, for sure. Uh, for other bills, it means that you're going to end up introducing nothing if it's a controversial enough uh, topic. Your bill will be so whittled down. Or you can actually introduce what you want and then you work to build a coalition. So we came in and we, ha we had a coalition behind us, but it was not as broad as it needed to be. Uh, and because it was in the second year of a legislative session, we effectively had about three months or four months to you know, do what we needed to do. And we, uh, we were getting more support at the end. We were making amendments around affordability and displacement and uh, more affordable housing groups were coming on. Uh, but we, we, you know, we hit a wall, ran out of time, uh, and ultimately just didn't have the support that we needed. Uh, so we, I announced immediately that we were not going to give up, and we immediately started reaching out to our constructive uh, critics, to the groups that opposed the bill or, to, or were neutral on the bill, but were not philosophically opposed, uh, and, uh, were, and were constructive critics. Uh, and, started, and I've been spending a lot of time in, in LA, um, as well as course the Bay Area, uh, working particularly with um, uh, equity uh, groups, uh, groups focused on uh, uh, renting displacement, but who understand uh, as well that uh, having uh, density is important, that exclusionary zoning is a problem, that banning poor people from your city is not okay. Uh, and so we've been working to try to expand the coalition, and I think we're having uh, some success. Uh, because when you're fighting both the, you know, the, the neighborhood anti-development forces throughout the state, and you're having to fight with folks, you know, in the equity world, it's just you. you it's that's a really hard fight to win, and so uh, we want to expand uh, the coalition. Uh, we're also we want to be more, a uh, uh, little bit more contextual in terms of particularly uh, areas that are. Uh, really at high risk of, um, of displacement uh, and giving perhaps some more flexibility uh, there so the cities can uh, uh, do what they need to do to, uh, to, to really slow or stop uh, those displacement uh, pressures uh, and to make sure that we are also um, 
that communities that may not may have stopped transit from coming there, but have a ton of jobs, uh, that they're part of the um, part of the the deal. Uh, so we're um, you know I feel good about the progress we've been making. Uh, we also um, know that we need more um, partners in LA, and we've been working hard. Uh, to do that, the LA and the Bay Area, of course, are very different in a lot of ways, but a lot of these housing pressures are quite similar uh, in the two cities. LA is probably five to 10 years behind uh, where, you know, and usually in San Francisco, we like to say we're ahead of LA, but uh, on housing, we're ahead in a, in a bad way. We got, we got to the bad place first, but LA is nipping at our heels. Uh, and so having LA and Bay Area working together, I think is really uh, important. But the LA politics are, Really hard. I, we, we um, there's a there's a sometimes in the Bay Area this arrogance about LA that they're uh, no one pays attention to anything, no one's engaged, and I'm here to tell you That's they're really important. engaged in LA, yeah. and, <laughs> um, and and so we've learned a lot, and um, I feel like we're going to have a better shot the next time around. Uh, I want to um, talk to Amanda about this. Uh, so the mayor, Mayor Garcetti, was, uh, I think, lukewarm at best on Scott's uh, bill last year. He was uh, for it, and then he wasn't for it. Right, right. right. <laughs> lukewarm was my take, yeah. right? Uh, so can, can you speak to some of the concerns that, that the mayor had um, on that version of the bill and what you would hope to see in a bill um, like this next year? Yeah. So I, I think just looking back to the, mayor, the mayor's concerns, which I think was your question, um, I think we probably didn't have as much clarity on certain things that we were perhaps concerned at the local level um, might create either confusion or create issues for the local discussion down the road. Um, but in the end, I think what we what we wound up with um, helped us to have a space to do the things that now the city is looking to do. So there is now local legislation, um, which which what passed in 2017 um, sort of allowed cities to have a certain set of rules, but then also be more specific if it, if it could. Um, of course, we've spent now almost two years, we'll be two years in, um, to having that local discussion, but some of those things will be um, limiting in the hillsides. Um, so we have a lot of hillsides in Los Angeles. For those that, that don't know that, that's a thing. Um, I know a lot of people oftentimes don't associate hillsides with LA, but it is hard to build in hillsides. Um, and so that's a conversation that the, that the city is now having locally as to whether or not um, that should be allowed with regard to ADUs. Um, so some of some of the, the specific things around ADUs, um, I think we've had the space now to have that conversation. Granted, the conversation still continues. Um, so I don't know if that, hopefully that answers your question. So do you expect big parts of LA to be exempt from what the senator might be doing or? or with regard to ADUs or, or no, more broadly? with regard to zoning. Um, I don't know that I can answer that question. Yeah, yeah that would be hard for me to answer. Right and if I can just say this, yeah. uh, Mayor Garcetti has actually been strongly yeah. supportive of, of it, so much of the housing work yeah. that's happening in Sacramento. I think he is just a naturally pro-housing um, elected official. Uh, he also has very difficult politics in LA to navigate uh, around the terms of city council and the neighborhood councils. Uh, and so I think last year he, uh, you know, I think he, he understood what we were doing, uh, but the politics, particularly around single family home zoning in LA are, are really hard. So we've been, uh, I know, and the mayor's office has been fantastic and, you know, working with, with my staff and, and giving us information and we're really appreciative of that. So we'll be staying very, very close with the mayor and, and also with city council members. Uh, in LA on this. I mean, local elected officials, uh, you know, often don't, we, you know, we're, and I, as a former one, again, we, you're, we're wired to, to, to tell the state to back away and stop telling us what to do. Uh, but I, I, I think we do have opportunities in LA to work with City Hall. I, and I would just, the, the only thing I would say is I think to, to the point, I mean, our office has been, we're in a position now where there, the, our homelessness problem, right? Again, that, that sort of is the um, forward facing view on why why we need more housing. And so for those reasons and lots of other reasons, the mayor has been yeah. very interested in seeing change. I, um, I, to, I was so impressed yeah. that Mayor Garcetti went out to that community meeting in Venice and just got yeah. yelled at for hours and hours and hours this and hours. This was a, about a homeless shelter proposal. That, like, about yeah. homeless housing. And uh, that was like incredibly impressive to me because that, that it's really hard. And he just, and I think he said that he was gonna stay until no one had any more, yeah. anything else to say. Uh, and that's really a sign of someone, and he still stood his ground. Yep. 
Um, he listened, but he understood that you, we have to do things differently. That's a sign of a mayor who, who gets it. And is trying to negotiate. I mean, I think the only yeah. thing I would, I would add is that it, you, when we're trying to add shelters in LA, right? So we're trying to build one shelter in each council district. There are 15 districts in, in LA. Um, and so what we're, what we're trying to do is think about creative solutions because many communities don't want a shelter. Um, so could you have ADUs instead? Could you have something else instead? Um, but importantly, if we're going to put shelters in your neighborhood, um, are there things that we can do as a city to offer you um, as, as, a, as a neighborhood that's going to have a shelter? Could we provide greater services? Could we have uh, trash pickup? Could we pay more attention to potholes? So we're trying to think about ways that, um, as a city, we do a good job of listening to the communities, uh, particularly those communities that are going to be willing to accept shelters. And so the meeting in Venice was, I think, a great example of, he was there, the mayor was there till I think 10.30 at night um, at a meeting that started somewhere around five o'clock. Um, it was slated to be one hour and wound up being five hours. Um, and so we took action after that, and we've taken actions now after that um, to try to continue the dialogue. That's, I think, the, the right position for a mayor to be in is having a dialogue. The other- We're, we're heading into Q&A, but go ahead. Okay, yeah, yeah just the, um, the other helpful thing that A27 helped initiate are conversations at the local level around um, the role of increased supply and in helping to alleviate the crisis. Um, you know, for, for a lot of people who are concerned that A27 can hurt vulnerable communities, there are also a lot of people that feel like having a massive increase of supply is the most helpful thing that you can have for communities that are feeling vulnerable so that they have a lot of options. Um, the city of San Francisco right now, when they build affordable housing, they're, they're paying about $300,000 per unit of public money to pay for affordable housing. Um, so if you build 100 units, that's $30 million, and then you can do the math from there. So this, to build your typical affordable housing tax credit unit um, is unsustainable for most cities, and San Francisco's production is gonna creep to a halt because the city is running out of money. So it has initiated conversations about the role of supply to help the crisis, and also by not, what is, what, are, what do displacement pressures look like in the status quo? What does not increasing supply do to um, exacerbate displacement pressures? And that's initiated a whole new set of conversations. I think you know, measuring the, the downside of the status quo is not something that we do a lot, and that bill is um, making us do that. So uh, our first audience question, I think I'm gonna direct this to Dan. Um, so is turning back NIMBYism a matter of persuasion or will in the end? Uh, there have to be a lot of angry people who are upset with uh, high-rise apartments. Are there any examples you're aware of where, say, some compromise has worked politically? Well, I, I think uh, what we found in our work that um, you can be effective in sort of educating and persuading a certain group of, of, of community members who might initially come out against a project or concerned about a project that, hey, this is the right way for this, the, the community or the city to go. And there's a other group of those that you, regardless of what you do, they're pr you're probably not gonna change their mind and you just have to acknowledge that in the process. So, um, you know, this, this is an example that's not sort of the inner Bay Area, but this is sort of outer Bay Area is an example of a community in Nevada, California, which is, is a community that's sort of been very protective of their single family neighborhoods. And we actually worked with the city on a neighborhood adjacent to their downtown that had actually been zoned for medium density 30 years ago, but the general plan was conflicting with it, so you couldn't actually build it. So we actually worked with them and went through a fairly um, uh, uh, complex process uh, engaging the community members about and, and introducing how they could achieve um, sort of this middle scale missing middle housing in this neighborhood in a way that would be good for their downtown. It would be good for many, many of those residents who were you know, aging baby boomers that might wanna downsize from that single family home and live near the downtown in a more walkable place. So I think that's just one example. And I think, um, I think in, in most instances where we've worked, there's the ability to bring a certain percentage of, of the community that might be sort of concerned sort of to, to support it um, and, and we've been successful in, in most of our projects to be able to do that. So one thing I want to just sort of press on quickly on this issue is I've, al I've always, I've never quite been able to figure it out myself, but you folks have more, certainly more experience than I do. When do you know that a group is just against something and won't be turned? Or when do you know when there's a group that can be or should be, or if you address some legitimate 
issues that they may have with the way something looks or the, or the way a, a um, or, or anything like that. How do you like, how do you know when to pull the plug? How do you know when to push back? And how do you know when to say, we're gonna you know, stream forward, roll forward? Adi, maybe. Yeah, I, um, I've often gotten guidance from a council member or a supervisor, you know, early meetings with their office and their staff, and they will tell you, as, as I learned in San Francisco, hey, your low parking ratio that may work in certain corners of the city are, is not gonna work here. Um, and you've gotta really increase that or I'm not gonna be able to support it. <laughs> um, you'll get some early, and, and then also here the 10 community groups that have influence that you should talk to. And then you'll have a bunch of one-on-one -on -one meetings and when you get yelled at enough for the same thing, you're like, all right, maybe I should do something different. Um, so really, I, I often rely on guidance from the supervisors or city council members district, both for their understanding, because in a lot of jurisdictions, um, the rest of the council or the supervisors will generally fall in line to what the supervisor representing that district wants. So that's a captive audience and you've got to um, get his or her approvals. Um, so they give you the early guidance. Um, and it's pretty rare that um, there's like an 11th hour surprise that that person hasn't had a sense of um, that was gonna come up. Our next question, I'll, I think I'll direct this to Amanda. Um, uh, so uh, how do you think transportation investments factor into this conversation about density and affordability, both local transit infrastructure, statewide efforts like high-speed rail or even uh, autonomous vehicles? Um, so in LA, I think it's two years ago now, we passed um, several measures that have helped really uh, help the city and the county and um, really look at transportation as it relates to just adding transportation, public transportation in LA. Um, and then also, in addition to that, thinking about how to co-locate um, transportation along with housing and how we, how we think about that as a whole ecosystem. Um, and so I think, you know, it, voters in LA gave us a sort of evidence that that was important. Um, and then as we think about things that are happening at the state level, uh, being able to collaborate and really think about how we do, do that, do both the things at the same time in a place like LA that is 10 years behind in San Francisco, um, where we're, maybe we have some more opportunity to really think about that because we're not built out. Um, how do we think about those two things together? Um, and so I think your voters have really given us I, the approval to do that and um, are showing up to think about how we do it thoughtfully, um, which I think the thoughtful part is the most important part now um, from the mayor's point of view, from our office's point of view, and from some of the activity that's happening in LA. Um, how do we bring all that and, and do, it, do it together? When you say thoughtful, can you explain a little bit more what you mean? I think, you know, informed by residents. Um, so we spend a fair bit of time, certainly in our office, um, engaging community members and co-creating. Um, so there's a fair bit of that happening around um, housing solutions. You know, a really good one or a good example um, is, is taking community meetings, but then also you know, putting a question out to community, but then also helping community design the thing that we're trying to design. Um, so I think you see more of that happening in government, which is certainly an exciting trend at the local level um, in the sense that we're, we're having a community move, they're actually taking the feedback and we're going back and we're redesigning and we're calling those same people back to come in and have a conversation. So thoughtful, but also informed um, and informed in a way that produces an outcome that reflects what you hear from the community. Now, does that, that doesn't always work. Um, that isn't always gonna be the answer. Not every solution um, has that, or not, not every problem warrants that solution. But I think certainly that's happening more um, at the local and at the county level um, in a place like LA. Senator, you look. I, I will say, in this area, um, LA, I think, is getting ahead of San Francisco and the Bay Area uh, because the, what was the ballot measure name? I always, M. the M. transit one? M. M, okay. Um, it's just extraordinary. It's just a, it is just extraordinary. A, I mean, the, the, the political organizing that had to happen and the fact that the voters authorized this just massive public transportation investment is, was extraordinary, yeah. and we need to do that here in the Bay Area. Um, I will say uh, transit investment is incredibly important. Uh, we're seeing a lot of good local stuff and regional work happening uh, that we, now that we were able to defeat Prop 6 and protect that $5 billion a year, which is almost a billion of that goes to transit. I think we're seeing good things happening. Uh, and, and transit does need to be paired with density. You need both. You have to have good transit to support density. But sometimes what we hear in argument, people arguing against uh, density is to say, 
we should not be putting new housing in until we've perfected the transportation systems and the infrastructure to support it. And it becomes this chicken and egg thing, which is, you know, ends up meaning no housing. And it's always going to be a little clunky and what follows what. And, uh, but we do have to make sure that as we're adding more housing, we are really focusing transit investments and, and, and we have this fight with BART extensions, we should be focusing our transit investment where the housing is going or will be going and stop with the transit, really expensive transit investments into hyper low density areas mm -hmm. that have resisted housing. We were able to stop the BART to Livermore extension, not because of anything against the Livermore area, but they were proposing a really paltry amount of housing uh, and we need to focus those scarce dollars where there is actually going to be housing density. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, that'll do it for this panel. Thank you so much, everyone, for your chat.